Welcome to Believers Mandate. Please like our videos, share and subscribe. Thank you and God bless you. So you and I are in the image of God, in the class of God, but it's within the jurisdiction of his moral attributes. Within the jurisdiction of his essential attributes, you and I are not there. This is why, although man, he said, ye are gods, because you are the children of the Most High, but you are not deity. You may have divine elements, but you are not deity. It's his essential attributes that makes him deity, but it's his moral attribute that makes his creation operate like the divine. If you look at, I think that's 1 John chapter 3. Help me now. Or 2 John chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. 2 John, I think that's the scripture. It says, according as his divine power. 2 John. Where's that scripture? Is it 1 John? 2 Peter. 1 verse 3 and 4. Quickly. We have Bible students in the house. He said, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So he didn't just give us things that pertain to life. He gave us things that pertain to what? Godliness. This is his moral attributes. And it is in this context that we can function like him. He said, through the knowledge of him, that means as you know it, that has called us to. See where we have called to? glory and virtue so it is within the context of his moral attribute that we operate in the god class but in his essential attributes we cannot come there because if we do we will become like god in his full essence as creator and as deity if we touch his essential attributes then we can be worshipped because we are not just divine we have become deities but we don't have his essential attributes so although we have divine elements we are not deity look at verse 4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by this ye might become what? Partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. So you are divine. But you are divine in the context of his moral attributes. You are partakers of the divine nature. This world is actually heavenly pantheon. You have come into the family of gods. That's why I say you are gods, little children. You are God's and has overcome them. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I say unto you, ye are God's because we are the children of the Most High. So, because we are born of God, we partake of his divine nature. But the dimension of his nature that we partake is the moral attributes, the moral quality, the moral nature, not the essential attributes. So, we are divine. We are not deity. That's why you can't worship us. We don't have omnipotence. We don't have omniscient, we don't have omnipresence, we don't have omnibenevolent, we don't have immutability, we don't have eternality, and we don't have self-existence. Those things are essential qualities of God. That's why he's deity. But in the context of moral attributes, we have his righteousness. We have his holiness. And I'm going to list them because these are moral attributes of God. So let's take it one after the other. Number one, his first moral attribute is that he is holy. And what does that mean? It means God is completely separate and incorruptible. He sustains sinless perfection. It is the inward character of his nature. He is separate and incorruptible, sustaining sinless perfection as his inward character or his inward nature. This is the first moral attribute of God. Leviticus 19 verse 2. Quickly, we have to be fast now. He says, speak unto all the congregation of the, of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I the Lord your God, I am holy. Are you seeing this? So this is his nature and this is a nature that he wants to impart. That's why it's a moral attribute. Moral in that the character of this nature is within the essence of morality. And moral because it's also an attribute that he expects us to uphold. To define our own character. So he first of all shares it with us. Now that he has shared it with us. He now expects us to live it. You can't live holy unless you have a holy nature. So what God does is that. He is perfectly holy. And then he imparts that holy nature into your spirit. He now expects you to renew your mind after that order. So that you can begin to live holy. Are you following this? So it's the first moral attribute of God. And it's a communicable attribute. Exodus 15 verse 11. 
Exodus 15 verse 11. These are the things that distinguishes our God. He said, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee? Glorious in what? Holiness. Glorious. His holiness is what exalts him above every being that claims to be God. He has perfect holiness. Sinless perfection, separate into his own class and incorruptible. Nothing can enter the realm of God. Only the things vetoed and vetted by God can enter his realm. So he's separate, he's in his own class. And this holiness is what defines the totality of his moral attribute. If we say God is love, the dimension of God's love is different from every love. If we say God is merciful, the dimension of God's mercy is different from every mercy. You can't compare any to him. It is a quality of God that makes him incomparable to any creation. Holiness, separation into his own class, incorruptibility and perfect sinlessness. And the reason God expects us to also live right is because he has imparted that attribute to us. Second moral attribute of God is perfect righteousness. God is absolutely right and is right always in all things. He is absolutely right and is always right in all things. The righteous character of God is a power and is his distinction mark in glory. Such that God cannot err, God cannot be wrong, and God cannot see, neither can he be tempted. Are you following this? Now, let me explain it to you. There is a level of righteousness where you are right because you know. So if I say, he is wearing an ash-colored cloth, I'm right. Because when you look, he's wearing ash. If I say it's black, I'll be wrong. Are you seeing that? Now, what if he was wearing black and I say ash? And then you look and it's ash. You now see that this thing is beyond just knowing. This is a power. The righteousness of God is a distinction mark in glory and it's a power. In that anything God says, that's what it is. If God comes here now and says today is tomorrow, it's not a mistake. If you check your calendar, you'll discover that today is tomorrow. What he says becomes. That is the power that makes him creator. So he showed up, there's darkness, he said, light be. You look around, suddenly there's light everywhere. If God comes to you and say, thou mighty man of valor, you say, me? My tribe is the least tribe in Israel. I am of the least family and I'm weak. I'm even crushing grains in wine press so that they won't find me. I'm fearful. Where is the mightiness? <laughs> He's right. After a while, you discover that you are mighty, you didn't know. That's his righteous character. He cannot err. He doesn't have the ability to err. First, because he knows all things. Secondly, because he has the nature that does only right. And thirdly, because he has a power that anything he says, that's what it is. That's why he can err. He knows all things so he can't make mistakes. Number two, he has the character that refutes error. And number three, he has a power that anything he says, that's how it is. If God comes here today and says, today is the end of the world. The world has ended. There's no mistake. Either because he knows today is the end. Or because he's consistent to only do what is right. Or even if today was not the end. Because he said it. It will go back to before creation. And today will be what was written as the end. So time and creation can disappear. For God to be right. So God is perfectly righteous. Now, because he's righteous and we have been brought into his class, he also imparted righteousness into our spirit. And so 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible said, he made him that was without sin to become sin for us, that you and I might what? Become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it's a communicable character. The reason you hope to live right, the reason your consecrations to live right will work, is because righteousness has been imparted to you as a nature and as a gift. Romans 5.17, the Bible said, They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. If you don't have his righteous nature as a gift, you can never be righteous. Moral attributes and communicable attributes. Number three, God is perfect love. 
This love is not just an emotion. It's an act of his will that gives him the power to give himself unconditionally. That's the love of God. It is not an emotion. There is an emotion as a part of it, but it's beyond an emotion. When we speak about the love of God, is a power that God possesses that makes him able, willing and able to give himself unconditionally. This is why God loves sinners. This is why God loves those who offend him. He said the ordinary man only loves those who love him. He said, but there is a realm where you love your enemies. There is a realm where you love your haters. That type of love exists only in God. See, man in his fallen state is a selfish person. You see people doing an engagement, carrying flower up and down. You know why? That person is their speck. The person satisfies their selfishness. That's why they are doing it. God is giving engagement to everybody and he's giving flower to everybody. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God does not love you more than he loves me. He can't. Because his love for you and I is not a criteria in us. It's a criteria in him. The way he loves you is the way he loves me. Now, if you fast for 40 days now, you may think God is closer to you and he loves you more. That's you thinking. If I have never fasted, God loves me equally as he loves you. Let me shock you again. If you are a righteous man and I'm a sinner, God loves you and I equally. That's why when Jesus came to die, he died for everybody. So whether those who are saved now and those who are not yet saved, he doesn't love one more than the other. In fact, the heart of God grieves when men go to hell because he loves every one of us equally. He can't love you any less. God doesn't have the ability to love one person more than the other. Even parents love some children more than others. And some children make their parents love them more than others. So when a man gives birth, the child that has good fingers, good hair, and is good looking, that's the one he's carrying everywhere, snapping picture with. And hey, this is my baby. The one that is... Uh, <laughs> Maybe the nose is a bit big or the height is not so. He will say, I have three sons. He <laughs> won't carry that one out. So he loves that child because of the way the child came out. And then there are other children that compare their parents to love them because they only do what is right. So the father will look at my son, come. This one that never does what is right. Get out from here, see your big head. He will even say it with aggression. And you can't blame him. The action is irritating. But you see, you can't irritate God. When you see God pities you, and it's not just empathy, he has compassion for you enough to do anything to save you, even if he has to die for you. That's perfect kind of love. Only God loves like that. And it's on the strength of that love that you and I are here. He said, God commended his love towards us. Romans 5 eight. In that why we, were, why we were yet sinners, why we had not known him, why we were in rebellion, God came and died for us. He paid the ultimate price. Meanwhile, that type of price, even if you have to pay it, it should be for somebody who is a friend indeed. It's a greater love than this that a man cannot can show that he gives his life for his friend. We were not his friends. We were his enemies. He died for us. Perfect love. And so when God expects us to love, he's expecting us to love because he has given us the love nature and he's expecting us to love because we were loved when we didn't deserve it. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, the Bible said the love of Christ, not our own love. Our love is selfish. I will love you if you can help me. I will love you if I like your face. I will love you if you are kind. I married my wife because I saw some things. <laughs> my brother, relax. <laughs> but not God. He loves you regardless of what you look like. He loves you regardless of what you can offer. He loves you regardless of who you are. He just loves you because it's his nature. And so he, he imparts that nature to you. And by his word and his spirit, he begins to train you to love like that. The love of Christ constrains us. He said, for we don't judge that if one died for us, we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but to live with the consciousness of the one who died for us when we didn't deserve it. So when I love somebody who offends me, 
I'm not loving him because he's reasonable. I'm loving him because when I was unreasonable, God loved me. So God's pattern has become my standard. I'm loving that person because I was forgiven when what I deserve was death. So God puts the nature in you and he gives you the spirit and the word to train you to become it because that is his moral attribute. He loves perfectly and unconditionally. Number four, God is perfectly faithful. Perfectly faithful. Perfectly faithful. This is absolute trustworthiness, loyalty, and reliability. His will and capability are absolute. This is a character, not just of his nature, but of his, of his word. He is absolutely trustworthy, he is absolutely reliable, and he is absolutely loyal. And these things are because his will supports it and his capacity supports it. You know, I was telling you a moment ago, I may want to help you, but I may not have the capacity, not God. God has both the will to and the capacity to. And because he's trustworthy, loyal, and reliable, he will always do what he has said. That is why he said, I am the Lord, I change not. So you, the children of Israel, are not consumed. So God is faithful. He is dependable and is trustworthy. It's a nature that only God possesses. 1 Corinthians 1 9. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Isaiah 25 1. It said, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 25 verse 1. God is faithful. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exhort thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderfully. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Thy counsels are what? Faithfulness and truth. Deuteronomy 32.4, Deuteronomy 7.9, you'll see this consistency. These four characters or quality, qualities are the moral qualities of God. He's absolutely holy, he's absolutely righteous, he is absolutely faithful, and he loves absolutely. Only God operates like that. 